All right, so welcome to our second interview of the show, which is it, which is with uh, Rosalind Stone. Um, Rosalind is, um, I guess I would say, a colleague because <laughs> we've um, worked together in like various capacities, and most recently, um, she invited me to talk. Um, on a kind of a series, I guess maybe you call it, she's running called Semantric Sessions. Um, but I just want to throw it over to you, Raz, to like introduce yourself um, as we've kind of discovered from doing this that um, other people do a better job of introducing themselves than we do. I guess you never know what's going to come out of your mouth when you've got to introduce yourself, but you gave a very brilliant lead in, Alex, because I, um, I first met you through your equally brilliant mother who put me in contact with you when I was considering doing a PhD and that was um, the initial idea was going to be about looking at date rape or the I mean, obviously that's a problematic term in and of itself but date rape in the media um, and the struggles that people go through as they have these lived experiences which are very much at odds with the media representation of how these topics are discussed and then as uh, life evolved and I started to work in drug policy reform which I did over the next few years I realized that this is a perennial problem it's not just around consent and sexual assault which remains one of my biggest interests within this realm as a whole um, but it's something that happens everywhere we use these stale stagnant metaphors again and again to talk about these topics um, and so I set up a project called the Symmetric Sessions. Um, it's a discussion group that meets once a week. And then we also have a membership who get access to the recordings of the discussions and to exclusive podcasts where we bring in different researchers to illuminate all aspects of the psychedelic and I guess psychedelic adjacent um, discourse by talking about the particular language they use, their particular bugbears with language that gets used. And one of the things that we challenge quite a lot, and I think this feeds into one of the questions you asked me actually on the tensions between psychedelics and capitalism, is this constant recurrent um, metaphor, extended metaphor of the brain reset that we take psychedelics and um, we're like a computer that has just been kind of put back to normal. And that is so counterproductive to dealing with any of the ongoing things which um, obviously one particular experience or even a course of therapy with some psychedelic experiences built into it um, don't eradicate and in any case I mean we call the industrial revolution the enlightenment but that's also when we started having all of these terribly socially damaging inventions like parks where you've got your kind of little bit of nature swaddled in the middle of the city as opposed to nature being this thing that's all around you when we started to exoticize and fetishize nature and see it as this thing that we could mine for all of its pharmaceuticals and put them in packages or head off to the amazon and have them in their original form exoticized but yeah so um the, a lot of that is the kind of caboodle of problems that we see so the semantics that we talk about these things in is entirely intrinsic to changing our approach to the world we live in. And it's all just about how we can bring as many people together to talk in as many different ways as possible about some of these things that we perceive as the evolving problems in the scene and which the scene itself could be the answer to if only we could find the words to talk about it better rather than to entrench some of the capitalist ideas that um needn't infect it but are the only vernaculars that we currently think we have at our disposal so yeah that's why the semantic sessions exist and I guess um not to make this answer go on too long but it's also why I left my job in drug policy where I was writing I was ghost writing for an MP I was writing all of these letters that were ending up verbatim on the prime minister's desk some of them are still online on the CDPRG website like the one I wrote to Boris Johnson um in the voice of Crispin Blunt about um changing the regulations around CBD um and the problem with political discourse 
facts is it's what in literary criticism, particularly Michael Silverstein pioneered this, would be called inert discourse, where you just use the same language over and over again, and you've got to do that to make it palatable to the person who's going to be reading it. And the result of that is that then you get this letter back written in the register that you wrote in, which enables them to not address any of the nuances that you tried to introduce. So you just end up in this back and forth, which is actually actively designed to make it impossible to change anything. And what we want to do with the symmetric sessions is engineer entropic discourse, which is when you use new metaphors, new ways of conceptualization, conceptualizing things, and then that results in the ability to think differently and then to invent differently the way that you behave and the protocols you want to design and the world you'd like to live in. So yeah, that's that's why we do what we do and why I don't do what I did. Um, and yeah, that's, I'm sorry, probably a long answer that you might want to cut quite a lot of. No, it's all good. It's all good. I think, um, you know, as you were talking, it just made me think about um, the staleness of the evidence-based policy discourse, which I had to, you know, engage with uh, throughout, uh, well, for a long time throughout my PhD thesis and beyond. And, you know, how it just felt like a, a kind of trap or like a revolving door where, you know, people were sort of seemingly kind of going to, oh, you know, drug policy needs to be evidence-based and that that was the end of the discussion. But then, then everybody agreed on it, you know, in, sort of at face value or in principle. Then, of course, in practice, you know, that didn't mean... It, it, it was actually kind of like an empty signifier because people threw it around as ammunition or people... I don't know, uh, we're sort of using it, you know, as a you know, people have all sorts of different understandings about what evidence might mean or, you know, what, you know, what they, yes, what they want, and wanted to see. Yes, and so often be an excuse to disqualify something based on a subjective perception that you don't necessarily get asked to explain if you're speaking from a senior enough position. Absolutely. And that's problematic in itself. Um, uh, yeah, so thanks for that. That That's really made me think. Um, um, I guess the first question that we wanted to ask you um, kind of ties back to um, um, something that we spoke about last month, which is uh, authenticity in general. And so we want to ask you about authenticity in the context of psychedelics. So um, what do you think uh, is an authentic psychedelic experience? Um, well, I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to go to... Alexander Shulgin for this actually um so um there is this uh, description that he gave um if I can find it um where is it where is it? I was really excited about it when I found it um so um Alexander Shulgin talks about funny I'd forgotten what comes to you when you take a psychedelic experience it, the psychedelic is not always a revelation of something new and startling you're more liable to find yourself reminded of simple things you know and forgot you knew seeing them freshly old and basic truths that long ago became cliches and so you stopped paying attention to them and Alexander Shulgin obviously incredibly important brilliant person um, who not not only gave us the insights from his subjective experience of so many compounds that he made, and he made my favorite compound that's one of the ones that's changed my life in the biggest ways, which is TCB. Um, so I'll be forever grateful to him for that. Um, but I think an interesting thing to think about is that his description of TCB is extraordinarily comfortable and quite erotic. And you only have to go to Arid or blue light to look at all of these descriptions of people having a absolutely terrible time on TCB and who's to say that their experience is less valid just because they're not Alexander Shulgin um, I mean I guess it's less verifiable and of course we've got this term that we use when we introduce our experiences in these forums that's born out of hiding from the legal context that we're inhabiting swim someone who isn't me so swim started to feel a bit disconcerted and then swim was suddenly swelling in this soup of trauma um but i think swim has every right to 
have that experience and describe it as it is and we had an interesting conversation really interesting conversation which actually if anyone's considering subscribing to the symmetric sessions then you can do it on our website our membership is just a five for a month um but we had a, a huxley special to celebrate the 70th anniversary of um the of huxley's first ingestion of mescaline this weekend um and jules was talking about um Jules was talking about how um, people have these really, really challenging psychedelic experiences. And often there's, and he set up a project called the Challenging Psychedelic Experiences Project. Um, and often there's no place to go with these experiences because they're pushed out of the media discourse, which at the moment is all about evangelization and hype. And it's very, very difficult to publish a piece in a mainstream paper, paper talking about anything other than having had a really transformative experience of psychedelics where you ex get this reset and it sorts your life out and certain you have a kind of Isla Wardman style really good day. Um, and it definitely seems to me that whereas when I entered into the world of trying to influence the media by putting scientists together with journalists to write about this stuff eight years ago, what I was um, there to do or felt I was there to do was to counteract um, enormous prejudice and demonization of psychedelics. Um, but now I feel like it's moved to a place where you can either demonize them or evangelize them, but there's no more nuance and there's just as much hype. Um, and so I guess also it comes down to a question of personal authenticity. And I think that's something that very, very much changes where you are in the world and what kind of experience you want to have. So when Huxley wrote The Doors of Perception, he talked about, isn't it good that we can now synthesize mescaline um, so there's no need to use the peyote cactus, but that's not what's gone on to happen. Humans love to travel across the world and use all of their air miles in order to have an authentic experience with the peyote cactus, which is now endangered as a result, not of the people who would have traditionally been using it in their indigenous traditions, but because of all of the people who want to go and have that experience. Um, and so uh, Dr. Anya Ermakova is someone who works on peyote conservation and all of the things that can be done to try to protect this. Um, it's not entirely endangered, it's vulnerable, but that's definitely a, a point in time at which we, we should be thinking about whether we personally as Brits really need to go and have that experience experience or whether synthesized mescaline might be better and in fact I would say synthesized mescaline is more authentic to us as people who come from a country which peyote is not endemic to anyway so yeah that's a, a jumble of thoughts but I think that we have this weird idea that plants are more authentic than chemicals even though in fact many of the um, medicines that come to us just for normal ailments in white boxes are actually from the rainforest that we're endangering as we mine them to get the medicines. But um, there's so there's this kind of medical respect for something a doctor has given you that looks nothing like a plant. But then when it comes to seeking out psychedelic experiences, we, we want it to be planty. We want our irregular shaped mushrooms. Um, we don't want um, the pill that Psilocy the psilocybin pill that Hoffman synthesized, even though Maria Sabina said it was just as good if you couldn't get any real mushrooms. And of course, mushrooms are now being uh, kind of industrially grown, so they're not endangered. But that's also, I would say, for not particularly authentic and quite vested reasons. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot there. There's media and capitalism and then the attempt to find a thread of authenticity through that and maybe decontextualize your own experience from all of that bullshit in order to have an experience which is true to you. Um, Tashin Narani also actually makes a really important point about the fact that if we're industrially farming cannabis and um, psilocybin to deliver psychedelic therapy on this industrial scale, we might be denaturing the actual messages that you get from the mushrooms as well. So I think there's a communion when you grow mushrooms yourself um, or when you're very careful to make sure that you bend down to eat them straight from the ground so that it doesn't count as picking them. I think there's something important that goes on there, um, which I would say is adulterated and stymied by getting them from a above board company in the 
post in a box. Well, I loved, I know you just described it as a jumble of thoughts and like, um, I hope you didn't mean that in like a negative way because I loved that jumble of thoughts. They were all so like, and I felt there's a million things like I'd want to pick up on that you just said, but to move us on to the next question, something you said that I think just really spoke to that was how, you know, psychedelic drugs, um, the lack of nuance in how they they tend to be spoken about where they're either like demonized or um, evangelized. Um, and like on that latter one, the idea of them being evangelized, it is the case that psychedelic drugs, um, you know, they are, are often talked about as though they're somehow better than other drugs, you know, whether that's like, you know, healthy, yes. like purer, like have the potential to be therapeutic, um, or more natural, as you said, as well. Um, is that something that you encounter in, in a lot of your subjective interviews in your work on sex on drugs, this idea that psychedelics are better? Oh, yeah, 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 like 100%. Um, so, yeah, from, from people who use drugs and indeed just kind of like in the cultural consciousness more generally, I guess, in media reporting, that kind of thing. So, yeah, this, this kind of hierarchy where psychedelic drugs are positioned as as some somehow better um and I guess I guess I, I we were interested in your thoughts on that um and also you know in in connection to that um you know what does this kind of hierarchy serve like you know or who does it serve um as well yeah a any thoughts you have on any of that um, I've got a lot of thoughts on that um it's so I feel like it is human nature for there to be hierarchy. Um, it's a really unpleasant facet of human nature, but I think if you do a course or you kind of start any kind of new thing where you get put in a group of people, you automatically kind of notice the people you think you'd like to be friends with and the ones that you weren't so sure about. And I think hierarchies naturally just form in our heads. Um, and then obviously it percolates in a clannish anthropological way in the sense that like you have the people who give birth to you and then obviously you're kind of under them in this structure of the family. And Nicole LaPera talks about all of the ways in this which can actually be really damaging to just unconsciously absorb all of these dynamics. And um, her work is, um, she's called The Holistic Psychologist on Instagram. She's amazing. Um, I, um, I can't afford a therapist at the moment, but I feel like she does at least half the job. Um, and um, she um, talks about this thing called conscious reparenting, which is where you notice patterns that you might have internalized, despite the fact that obviously most parents are doing the best they can and doing it beautifully. Um, but there's still these dynamics that come from human innate sense of hierarchy, which we end up unconsciously having as our programming until we address them. And there's that Jungian thing of what you don't address on the inside, you'll go on manifesting in the outside world. Um, and where I think I'd start to like to relate this to drugs um, is that obviously there's all sorts of different classification systems for what substances do. So the who does it according to different pharmacological groups and where they're going to be acting on your body. Um, but when you make health political, that turns into, I'm, I'm just going to talk about the UK because that's why I know and where I'm from and the think tank that I worked in was UK based. Um, but um, you get uh, scheduling, which relates to the permissions of what you're allowed to do with the substance. Are you allowed to prescribe it? Are you allowed to research it? Are you allowed to sell it in a pharmacy? And you start with schedule one's the most restrictive. So that's where most of the classic psychedelics are at the moment unfortunately is in this position where it's like really hard to research them stigma increases as you go up the um, scheduling system as well and then we've also got um, the classification system which relates to the legal penalties around what you're doing with the different drugs and kind of whether you're just supplying them to friends or you're using them for personal use or trading prolifically and internationally. Um, 
And I feel like this has led to a sense in which a lot of people conflate being legally safe with being medically safe. Um, and one of the things that's so completely bizarre about where psychedelics sit in the current classification system is that they have a really, really, really high LD50, which is um, means that you have to take a absolute ton in order to take an amount that could kill you and I don't think even with LSD that I mean people who trip for days but with one woman it actually cured her of back pain there's a scientific paper and I can't remember the name of it but um it has been documented that really really high doses of LSD are absolutely god awful in the moment but um it, it has never killed anyone on its own what kills people is the combination of the altered state combined with unfortunate um actions and silly things like walking out of windows or like swimming into the sea or whatever like there's so many ways in which you can do something stupid in this altered state but in terms of the innate toxicity of the substance that is not um a justification for them being where they are and it's also actually interesting to note with psilocybin there was never a scientific reason research justification for putting it in schedule one in the first place it was just put there because it was being thought about around the same time as lsd so when i was working with the conservative drug policy reform group we were repeatedly asking for the papers that um had the analysis that showed why psilocybin was a schedule one drug because we thought this would be important to analyze in determining whether or not it should stay there which obviously it shouldn't um but I think that, um, that like all of this goes to show that there's this um, what Maya Angelou would describe as the distinction between the personal and the political, where people's subjective experiences in all of these really nuanced, intelligent ways that these substances can be used are being erased from a dialogue which is oversimplified because it's got to be oversimplified in order to use these categorization systems where you're kind of a bit like offering duplo to a child that's ready to play with lego um and um i think a metaphor that i would like to use considering this is the people in dance floors podcast actually in terms of looking at like how we think about categorizing drugs um is that particularly with the synthesized the pharmaceutical drugs and i'm thinking particularly of categorizing of opiates it is a dance and the pharmaceutical industry creates and markets prolifically these drugs particularly amphetamine for adhd and um, and it's our choice whether we take them or not but essentially they are the ones holding out their hand to stop Start the dance to start the tango and if we accept and we put their hand in their hand and we put the pill in our mouth then that is where the magic happens um you don't get a drug having effects outside of the context of being ingested by a person in which it has the effects um and i think that this is really really often forgotten when we think about drug hierarchies and obviously with a lot of these marketed drugs particularly marketed in the US like it's impossible to open a glossy magazine without being recommended that you take ADHD medication at the moment and um, so there's a lot of accountancy but no accountability um, and certainly no personal accountability so we don't kind of fall asleep thanking the Sackler family personally when we start to feel calm for the first time and it's, it's great when you start to feel calm for the first time if that was unimaginable um, but we also don't curse them when we can't get any more opiates and we're encouraged to turn inwards at that point and to feel dirty and blame ourselves as we develop these addictions that actually came from saying yes in the first place to this dance that wouldn't be happening if the things weren't being manufactured and marketed and propping up different factions of policy in the first place so I think there's a an interesting trifecta there between the pharmaceutical companies the media and policy and that certainly bleeds into the way that drug for hierarchies are considered and I'm not sure what the answer is in terms of emancipation from that but I definitely think it's intelligent discussions like the ones we're having thank you for that um yeah, because I guess like I was kind of stuck thinking, you know, um, it's, it's it tends to be in the interests of uh, kind of venture capitalists who are looking at 
uh, opportunities to expand into psychedelics to um, kind of to go with the evangelizing um, stuff so that they can distinguish and make psychedelics unique compared to other drugs that have a more dirty reputation I guess in part because those drugs can be more acutely toxic and they can they can potentially um, and they, they 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 tend to be associated with addiction in a much more significant way but um, I certainly didn't didn't think about um, didn't think about it in the way that you did and that has opened up some new avenues for me so thank you for that um, well, thank you for a really great question. One thing it actually made me curious about, I'd love to get you guys' thoughts on, is do, how responsible do you think the Zoom culture um, that happened over the pandemic is? Because for me, I really feel like people were able to turn themselves into these authorities and these behemoths online, and it was the perfect time to stay in and create really good websites and focus on your SEO, which you don't have time to do in the real world when you're actually going out doing the things um and people all these online courses where you could pay tens of thousands of pounds to have never actually been in a room with a therapist but then qualify to call yourself a healer sprung like how responsible do you think our online identities and the possibilities that go with them are for what's going on now I mean, it's a really good question. I feel like I'm guilty of that because I was like, let's do the People and Dancers website. Let's do some podcasting and, like, you know, kind of like launch myself into it without really having much of a clue what I was doing. But I also feel as though there I mean, is a that's difference. what we've done too. But I think enough of us need to exist that we're not the people that are just kind of being mind bloom or compass or any of the ones that are clearly just in it for money. Absolutely. I think there's a difference between, you know, we need to make a marked distinction between people that are trying to make a profit and kind of ped wisdom through kind of dubiously acquired uh, qualifications versus people who are just kind of putting their thoughts out there in a way that is not for profit and just for for the purposes of sharing and and or having conversations and I think that yeah. those two things are very different yeah and none of us are recommending people take ketamine without mentioning bladders exactly that is that is a very good point. We I think we didn't really mention bladders that much uh, when we talked about ketamine a couple of months ago, but maybe we should have done and, and maybe we will. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the 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 next question that I've got for you is basically about um, kind of legitimacy uh, as related with people's uh, positive experiences with psychedelics in general, um, in, sorry, in, in particular and drugs in general. Uh, so thinking about um, whether it's enough or is it sufficient for somebody to say, this is good for my mental health and therefore I'm going to do it without having a sort of uh, you know, without being propped up by a, a legitimate authority, whether it be medical or religious or or, or, or both. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's absolutely fucking got to be. Um, and I guess the best place to, so I don't know if you want to edit out the swear or you're not, I just tend to kind of do it quite a lot. Um, but um, I feel like hopefully sparingly enough that it makes the impact I want it to have um but I think that if you go I'd like to go to the emerald tablet to this the kind of Blavatsky popularized idea of as above so below um if you've got these people that are above that are telling you what to do with your mental health and what the effects are then surely it matters enormously what what's going on below um as you the little people are taking the medicine um and there's this really really brilliant letter which um, Antonin Arto wrote um, in, I think it was, um, I'm actually just going to get it up because I would much rather quote it accurately. Um, so, dear legislator of the 1916 bill um, passed in July as the 1917 Drug Act, you are an ass. There is one sickness against which opium is supreme, and this sickness is called anguish. In its mental, medical, psychological, logical, or pharmaceutical form, call it what you wish. Anguish makes men mad, anguish damns men, anguish does not know, anguish your doctor cannot hear. Anguish constricts life's umbilical cord. By your iniquitous act, you have placed the right to control my anguish. Anguish in me is fine as all the 
needles of all of health barometers into the hands of men I have no confidence in whatsoever. Medical asses, dung druggists, malpracticing judges, doctors, midwives, and grandiloquent inspectors. Now, I don't think, and I've studied Otto's corpus quite extensively, that he would have bothered writing about his addiction to laudanum and then opium at all in its own right, were it not for people interfering with him taking it. Um, and he was producing all of this incredible art, and he also took it in his own hands to go to Mexico to experience peyote as a means of quitting and um, that was really successful for a bit it was coming back to France and to all of the context that had made him miserable in the first place which put him back on to opium but I think people generally have it in them to know what's best for them and I think addiction is a really interesting place to look at this because I think that's another really problematic word um, and so for instance I finally succeeded in leaving a really toxic relationship which was very much an addiction and if you look at addiction research on toxic relationships you're in this chemical bond where you get fired up on oxy I'm obviously simplifying the science enormously but you get fired up on oxytocin then it all gets taken away there has been a lot of research on how this like sudden deprivation of all the kindness that you got used to for a few minutes is exactly the same in terms of what's going on in the brain chemistry of addiction withdrawal and part of my process as I was gathering the strength to leave this dynamic um, was I took up smoking, which I hadn't done for about six years. Um, and I don't smoke anymore. I've replaced it with, I, I'd say, Symantrix is my biggest addiction at the moment. Um, but um, it, it's about having giving yourself something to do to replace the other thing that you were doing it's about um if if you can't change those neural pathways or interrupt them in the way that something like ibogaine is so amazing for doing but then again there's there's a lot of hype around that and it shouldn't be tackled as a silver bullet and the traditional breezy traditions that it was meant to go with should be respected but I think if you if you haven't got a different pharmacological option to snip those neural pathways and change things, then I think using your personal instinct about what other addiction to take up instead of the one that's actively damaging you at the moment is actually a really sensitive way to progress through life to a point at which you are not doing these things which are neurotoxic or physically toxic and I think that there's there's a massive tendency to particularly smoking to to demonize it in terms of the health risks that it undeniably is associated with um but I mean if it's if it's getting you out of something which is otherwise going to derail your life in a much more significant way then I think it's a, a, a hot little bridge that I think can be quite all right in the moment Thank you for that answer. Like that was so interesting, and like yeah, listen, listening to you speak about your experiences, then um, it really made me think about the way that, um, like my fr my friends and I kind of joke, you know, and you know, you know, often when you're joking, you you're saying something quite serious, but saying it in a jokey way, um, you know, we joke about kind of like circling through our or cycling, sorry, through our addictions, where it's like. You know, we'll we'll do this one for now, and when it becomes too much of an issue, we'll do we'll move on to this one. And oh, know. that's so nice to hear that that's something that's in you guys' discourse as well, because oh. it's very much something I've just been looking at privately, and this is kind of the first time I've like talked about it this explicitly in a context. But I mean, it felt right for kind of the intimacy of this podcast. But it's, yeah, it's so nice to then find it is in a context that exists outside of. Oh. Oh, absolutely a hundred percent and so honestly something I, I think like um I, I would like to yeah think about more and pick up on more and hopefully like Julia and I we can do that like as as we because what we'll do um is we'll reflect on this conversation like after we play it on the show um and I would I really I hope we remember to pick this up <laughs> Me saying this now is a reminder to future us. Pick this up. <laughs> I think we definitely will. I think we definitely will. <laughs> <laughs>